Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for today. And you truly are great and you are awesome. And God, I pray that your power would be, would be manifested in this place, Father. I pray that you would meet with us. And God, that the presence of your spirit would be without question. And God, that you would draw those who are unsaved unto yourself. And God, we pray for their salvation. Lord, I pray that you would send the wind and the fire of revival. You'd stir our hearts, stir us up, roll over, roll over us, Father, with the tides of revival and place within our hearts a burning desire to live more faithfully for you than we have in times past. Burden our hearts, Father, for those who are unsaved. God, place within us a longing for your pleasure. And Father, I pray that once again your people would return to you with humble and broken spirits, contrite hearts. And I pray that you'd bind us up, Father, and that you would use us once again for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, how many of you are fired up to hear the word this morning? Amen? Okay, good. Just want to check, make sure. That's good. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you if you would to go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. That's where we'll be today. We're continuing on with our series, Disciple, What It Truly Means to Follow Jesus. This morning's subtitle is The Characterization of Discipleship or The Characterization of the Cross. In other words, um, what, character, what characters does the Bible use to describe a disciple? Okay, so the characterization of discipleship. What are the characters, the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe a strong disciple. And so that's one of the things that we're going to discuss this morning is what does a strong, let me emphasize that word again, what does a strong disciple look like? Well, we'll find out here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's start reading there in verse 1. When you're ready, say amen. All right, so here we go, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, he says, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Here it is. Three characters. Notice verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the one who recruited him. Also, here's the second one. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Here's the third one. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding and everything. And then I like what he says over, over in verse 8. He says, keep your attention on Jesus Christ. That's good, isn't it? Keep your attention on Jesus Christ. As risen from the dead, descended from David... This is according to my gospel. Keep your attention on Jesus Christ. Herb Hodges has written a book uh, on discipleship. And in this book, he talks about D.L. Moody. Now, some of you probably don't know who D.L. Moody is. So let me just give you a, a brief commentary. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist of the 1800s. I would say he's much like Billy Graham, but sadly, we are a new generation is coming along who they don't even know who Billy Graham is. So here's what you need to know: he is a he was a fiery, soul-winning preacher of the 1800s, and he would go all over preaching the gospel. Now, Moody would not allow the song. Onward Christian soldiers 
I, I, I'm distracted for a moment, so let me just pull you in. I, I was making sure I wasn't having a brain aneurysm. Is it, real, is it flickering up here? Okay, all right, all right. Just want to make sure that I wasn't having some type of brain malfunction. Okay, uh, call for help because uh, my eyes are, are all over the chart right now. So praise the Lord for that. All right, but here's the thing. He would not allow the song Onward Christian Soldiers to be sung at his crusades. Now, let me just share with you a few of those words from that hymn, just so you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, Onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then, ye people, join the happy throng, blend our voices in triumph song. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, forward into battle, see the banners go. Some would say, well, why wouldn't he sing that? And those are powerful words. The reason that Moody would not allow the, that song to be sung is he said because he didn't know of anyone who could be truly characterized as a Christian soldier. In other words, the Christians that he knew weren't living as soldiers. And for that reason, he would not allow that song to be sung. Was Moody right? I don't know, but that was a conviction that he had. I will suggest this, that I, be, I do believe that we have many believers who are living as Christian soldiers. Uh, I've gone overseas and I've seen believers who have been tortured and beaten and persecuted. Just recently there were more Christians uh, Libyan Christians beheaded by ISIS for their faith in Christ. And so to say that there are no Christian soldiers uh, is, an, is an overstatement. But here's what Moody was saying. He says, there's not any that I know. He probably wouldn't say that there were not any around the world. He was just saying that there wasn't any that, that he knew of. And can I suggest to you this morning that those who I know who I would truly consider a Christian soldier are few. And there are times in my own life where I don't soldier as I should. That's an indictment upon the church. Would you consider yourself to be a strong disciple? A mathetes, that's the Greek word. A follower, a learner, a pupil of Jesus. Would you consider yourself, young people, would you consider yourself a strong follower of Jesus? Because there are a lot of people who are saved, don't get me wrong, and they're followers, but we're making a distinction this morning, not between those who are lost and those who are saved. We've done that in the weeks past. What we're doing this morning is we are making a distinction between those who are disciples and those who are Strong disciples. but Because that's where the Lord wants you to be. You understand that? Do you understand that you were born again to go to war if you're a Christian? You are born again. You are born from above. You are saved in order to go to war. We're in a war. It's a spiritual war. And many Christians have fallen casualty to this spiritual battle because they are not strong disciples. They are not living as soldiers. Are you? Are you living as a Christian soldier? Look at your Bibles there at verse 1. I just want to make a few comments. He says, you therefore... My son. And so you need to read this with a, with, a, uh, with a sense of tenderness. Paul is being tender with Timothy. It's a command. He says, be strong. That's an imperative. It is a command, but it's a tender command. He says, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. A spiritual father talking to his son. Be strong, my son. 
And I told you that be strong is an imperative, which means it's a command. However, it's spoken with a tender voice because of the phrase, my son. But it's also, listen to this, it's also in the passive tense. What that means is this, is Paul is telling Timothy that the strength that he needs is not in him, it's outside of him. So literally what he's saying is this, Timothy, my son, be strengthened by the Lord. Be strengthened by the Lord. Why is that significant? Because many of us are trying to find strength in ourselves. Many of us are trying to live life in our own power, our own strength, and we do well for a season, but eventually we, go, we grow weary and we falter. Because our strength, our, our power is never enough. But God's is more than enough. So what Paul is telling Timothy here, he's saying, as a disciple, put yourself in a position daily to walk in the power of God. Now, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. The Holy Spirit of God indwells you. The Holy Spirit of power and of strength. So what that means is this, every saved person has the strength and the power of God in them the problem is is that we don't put ourselves in a position daily to walk in that power to draw from that resource because many of us are so worldly that we're not any spiritually good we've allowed ourselves to be distracted by all the things of the world we spend more time on our iPhones, our smartphones, and our video games than we do in the Word of God. We spend more time watching television than we do the Scripture, just spending time in the Scripture. We spend more time on the golf course or in the bass boat than we do in church. If Christ is not priority, if he is not number one in our life, if we are not spending significant time in his word, in prayer, in service to him, then we are not going to be a strong disciple. You know why? Because you're not going to be walking in his strength and his power. You're going to be walking in your own. So, as your pastor this morning, my dear, my dearly beloved church, put yourself in a position to be strengthened by God. He says, what we have heard, or what you have heard from me, and what you learned this morning, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust, and that's the title of our youth ministry, Entrust. Entrust these things, these things that you're going to learn today. Entrust these to others. Teach this to others. And by the way, this teaching, as you've heard me say many times, is more caught than it is taught. What that means is this, is people are going to learn from you, not necessarily by what you say, because we, we, get, we can flap our lips all day long, but, but they're, going to, they're going to learn from you by observing what? How you live. Be strong in the Lord. Be strengthened by God. And what you learn today, entrust it to others. Invest it back into their lives. So, What's the first characteristic of a strong disciple? A strong disciple is one who stays focused. For those of you who like to write down my points, that's my first one. A strong disciple is one who stays focused. He uses the metaphor of a soldier to prove that point, doesn't he? What do we know about soldiers? Soldiers are focused. They are focused individuals. They're focused on the task at hand. Look at verse 3. Share in the sufferings as what? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
There's four things that he tells us about a good soldier. The first thing is this. A good soldier is one who suffers hardship. Look at your Bible. Share in suffering as a good soldier. So a good soldier does what? A good soldier endures suffering. I don't know about you, but I watch the, the news or look on Facebook and I hear about these Christians, even as, as, uh, as new as yesterday, Christians who are being martyred, who are being killed for their faith in Jesus. And there's a part of me that agonizes, but there's also a part of me that has great joy, not in their death, but in their profession of faith in the midst of their death. The fact that they are good soldiers because they're willing to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. What about you? A a strong disciple is one who stays focused. They stay focused. Why? Because they're a good soldier. And what does that mean? It means you're willing to suffer hardship for the name of Jesus. My wife and I have been talking much about that. And, and we say, well, what does that look like here in America? Because around the world, that makes sense. Because Christians are being persecuted around the world. And, and we understand what it means for them to suffer hardship. It means to stand strong in the face of the persecution. But what does that mean for us here in America who are not necessarily facing such persecution? What does it mean to suffer hardship? Listen, it means this. Whatever difficulty you're going through right now, whatever trial you may in, it may be in. It may be financial. It may be physical. It may be some type of disease. Whatever it may be. Whatever situation you find yourself in, a good soldier endures through that suffering focused, bringing glory to God. I know, I hope you don't ever feel like that I'm, that I'm getting on, on you. I mean, sometimes I may want to, sometimes you need to feel that way because I am. But, but here's the thing, I'm not always doing that sometimes I just share things because it's it's reality of where we are okay so I'm going to share some things that are going to be quite convicting and some of you are going to think I'm talking about you but I don't I, I'm not talking about you the Holy Spirit may be talking about you but here's the thing we in America we think it's suffering if we have to go to church four days on in, in one month on Sunday well, I went twice this month. My goodness, what does he expect? I went twice. I went more this year than I didn't go. I went more this year than I did last year. I mean, my goodness. You want me to do what? You want me to wake up early and go where? You want me to give what? Right? Hey, listen to me. Y'all draw in real close. Y'all close? Soldiers don't whine. <laughs> Suck it up. Amen? Stay focused. Suffer hardship. Number two, a soldier is, look at what he says. A soldier not only suffers hardship, verse three, share in suffering as a good soldier. Now look at verse four. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. And by the way, the Bible says the one in active service. So number two, a good soldier is one who is active in, in service. That's what it means to stay focused. Not only do you endure suffering, but you're active. What that means is this, is that being a Christian is not 9 to 5. Being a Christian is not even a 60 or 70 hour week. Being a Christian is a 24 hour every single day responsibility. Being a good soldier is a way of life. We don't punch a time clock. He says every soldier in active service. That means you're to do your part. You have a responsibility. God has gifted you. God has called you. God has enlisted you. You 
You're to be active in service. Now listen, I'm going to say something else. It might get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it. I believe, and I'll preface it by, by sugarcoating it just a little, okay? I'll put a little... I'll put a little brown sugar on top of it so it'll be easier to swallow. Here it goes. I, I, I think the church should minister to people. Are you with me? And those of you who know me, you know that. If you need me, I'm going to be there. I'll sit at the hospital with you all day long. I'll be at a surgery, whatever. I, I'm going to be there. I think the church has a responsibility to minister to their folks. Amen? So I'm saying that. All right? But... What the church doesn't have a responsibility of doing is coddling you. Soldiers don't, they need to be checked up on and they need to be held accountable. But soldiers don't need to be coddled. And when a soldier goes on leave, he knows that he's supposed to do what? Report back. Am I correct? When the soldier goes on leave, he has a responsibility to report back. But you know what church is full, you know what churches are full of today? People who miss church for weeks and then they whine and complain because nobody called them. Well, nobody came by and saw me. Nobody came by and checked on me. We're just gonna leave and we're gonna find another church to, to go to. You know what I want to say? Soldier up! Report back to duty. Amen? I know that that doesn't feel good. And I'm not talking about not ministering to people. But I'm talking about getting over yourself. Dying to yourself. Taking up your cross and following Jesus. Get in the trenches and roll up your sleeve and get some mud on your face. Amen? And serve Jesus. All right. This is going to be a two hour long sermon if I don't get going. All right? Stay focused. What does that mean? Suffer hardship. Be active in service. Number three, don't get entangled in the affairs of the world. Isn't that what he says? No soldier in active service concerns himself with civilian affairs. Literally, it's that word entangles. No soldier entangles himself with civilian affairs. He's not saying that you shouldn't have contact with the world because we should. What he is saying is this, you shouldn't become entangled in the world. Uh, let me make it very practical. Some of you have friends, just like I do, after I was saved, what they wanted to do and what I wanted to do are now two different things, correct? Right? They're still wanting to do the old things. Well, I've been changed. I'm wanting to do the new things now. But I still had a relationship with them because I want to see them saved, right? But I did not become entangled with them. Are you getting that? In other words, I didn't go back to do, doing what they were doing. I didn't get entangled in the world. Why? Because I've been called out of the world into the kingdom of God's Son. And so a good soldier suffers hardship, is active in service. A good soldier does not get entangled with the affairs of the world. Why? Because it distracts you from serving God. Do you know why the church needs revival today? Because many Christians have allowed themselves to become entangled in the affairs of the world. And we need for revival to come to stir God's people up and remind us that we've been called out of the world into the kingdom and we are to be faithful soldiers. We are to stay focused on the task at hand and that is to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. So a strong soldier, a strong disciple is a soldier who stays focused. Are you getting that? Let me say it again. A strong disciple is a soldier who stays focused. And why does he do this? 
Look at verse 4. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian affairs. Why? Because he seeks to please the one who recruited him. That's the motivation to be a good soldier is you want to please Jesus. Correct? I want to please Jesus. I'm going to suffer hardship when it comes. By his grace, I'm going to suffer hardship for his glory. I'm going to be active in service. I'm not going to get entangled with the affairs of the world. Why? Because I want to bring pleasure to the one who enlisted me. A strong disciple is a soldier who stays focused for the pleasure of Jesus. I have a lot more I have a lot more I want to say here but I'm just going to move on past it. The word of God says that no one can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other or he'll hate the one and love the other. You can't serve both God and money, the scripture says. If you try to serve God, both God and the world, are you with me? If you allow yourself to become entangled in the world and worldly material things capture your attention more than spiritual things, then you are, see if this describes you, you are going to experience a moral and spiritual decline. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you this morning are experiencing a moral and spiritual decline? You're compromising. There's things in your life that you're doing, watching and listening to and saying that you used to wouldn't have, you, 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 before you would not have. You think that you're older now. You think you're a more mature Christian. So now you can go back to watching those things because they're not going to bother you now because you're mature. That's deception. If you, are, if you are experiencing a moral and spiritual decline, a moral decline, you've got compromise in your life. A spiritual decline, your relationship with the Lord is not like it needs to be. If that's you, it's because you have allowed yourself to become entangled in the affairs of the world. What does moral and spiritual decline lead to? You know what it leads to? It leads to a compromise of the truth. Because now you become, now you're more about pleasing people than you are God. Hear me now. If you are more concerned about pleasing people, you will compromise truth. Because truth is offensive. And if you're afraid of offending people, you'll compromise truth. When Jesus came preaching truth, what did they do to Jesus? You know what they did. All 12 of the apostles were martyred except for John, and he was exiled on the island for preaching truth. Number two, a strong disciple is one who is a disciplined athlete. A strong disciple is a disciplined athlete. Look at your Bible. Also, verse 5, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. One thing I know about the Apostle Paul is that he loves sports. <laughs> On several occasions, Paul uses the sports analogy in order to, to prove a spiritual point. And by the way, that's what he does here. He, he uses that metaphor of an athlete. And really the word there, it, it means to contend or to wrestle. Someone who is willing to fight. Someone who is willing to wrestle. It is the idea of a struggle which takes discipline and dedication if you're going to win. When I played football in high school, I can remember my senior year. And I was one of those guys, I didn't, I didn't lift a lot of weights. I didn't eat right. Okay? I was just a corn-fed country boy. That's who I was, right? I, I'd hold hay all my life. I didn't need to lift weights, I thought. So 
I, I didn't go to the weight room and do all those things. And I, I was, and, but we had this, a freshman, a freshman. And he didn't have the natural abilities that a lot of us had. But he worked harder than every one of us. He ate right. He ran. He was in the weight room all the time. Before long, he was squatting and bench pressing and all those things more than the rest of us as a freshman and earned a starting line, a position on the varsity team as a freshman. It's not because he had more natural talent. It was because he had greater discipline. It is no different in the Christian life, young people. You want to be a strong follower of Jesus? You have got to be disciplined. Disciplined in the Word. Disciplined in prayer. Disciplined in your service to God. Disciplined in staying away from those things you know you should stay away from. And clinging to those things that are good. Oh, make no mistake about it, a strong disciple is a disciplined athlete. He says here, and by the way, we're not trying to outperform each other, are we? Our competition's not one another. Our competition is our own sinful flesh. I need to be disciplined. Because I'm in war. Yes, I'm in war with the world. Yes, I'm in war with Satan. But make no mistake about it. My greatest enemy lives within me. Because Satan cannot make me sin. He can only tempt me to sin. But I've got to be willing to give in to the sin. So my greatest enemy is myself. Do you know that about you? That's why Paul says, put no confidence in your flesh. So you're not trying to compete with other people. You are competing against your own fleshly impulses. And if we're going to be victorious, he says, you must, you must play according to the rules or work according to the rules. Look at what he says. Verse 5, also if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he what? Competes according to the rules. Now here are the rules in this day, in the Greek games. If you were going to play in the Greek games, number one, first you had to be born a Greek. You had to be a true Greek. Number two, you had to prepare at least 10 months before the games and swear that before Zeus. They didn't want some, they didn't want some, undisciplined guy showing up at the last minute and trying to compete. You had to commit to training for at least 10 months. Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. All right. At 10 months and then swear before Zeus that that's exactly what you did. So you got to be born a Greek. You got to train 10 months. Third, you have to obey the specific rules that are given. And if you do that, you can compete. A Christian athlete, you got to be born again. Swear your allegiance to Christ and compete what? According to the rules. That's what it means to be disciplined. I'm saved. My allegiance is to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I am going to be a disciplined athlete. I am going to be a strong Christian. I'm going to seek to live my life according to the rules. Not to try to earn God's love, but because I already have God's love. I don't read and obey the Word of God because I'm trying to earn favor. I read and obey the Word of God because I have favor, I have love, I have His grace, and I don't deserve it. And because He has given me these things that I don't deserve, it motivates me to want to please Him. So a strong disciple, a focused soldier, and a disciplined athlete. The Apostle Paul himself said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, 
but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way as to win the prize. Not everyone who competes, competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away, but we a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, listen to this young people and all of us, instead discipline your body, make it your slave, Bring it under control. He says, don't allow yourself to be controlled by your fleshly impulses. But discipline yourself to take your fleshly impulses under control. Two things are going to happen in your life. Are you with me? Here it is. You're either going to be controlled by your flesh or you're going to be controlled by the Spirit. You're either going to be prone to giving in to fleshly impulses. Or you're going to live your life in such a way where you take those fleshly impulses under control. You discipline your body. You take those things under control. Listen, I'm not a slave to my body. I'm not a slave to my fleshly impulses. I'm a slave to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Therefore, I'm going to discipline my body and take my fleshly impulses under control by His strength and by His grace for His glory. Some of you are with me. Praise the Lord. John F. Kennedy was assassinated November the 22nd, 1963. How many of you know that his Secret Service men who were given the task to protect him told him to put the plastic bulletproof bubble over his car before he went in the parade? Did you know that? He had a little bubble that went over the... And you can go on the internet and you can see it other times where he would use it. He had, a little, he had a little bubble that would go over the back of the car and he would sit underneath that. That day, he refused to put the bubble on. He refused what? To put on his protection. And it cost him his life. What does the Bible say? Be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. So that you might stand firm against the tactics of the devil. Many Christians today are easy prey to the enemy. Many Christians today are, are given over to their fleshly impulses. And they're not strong disciples. You know why? Because they're not walking under protection. And they're exposed. A strong disciple is a focused soldier. A strong disciple is a disciplined athlete. Lastly... A strong disciple is a hard-working farmer. A hard-working farmer. Boy, and if I know anything about any of these, this is the one. Some of you, could, some of you really uh, resonated with the soldier. Amen. I, I thought that about you, Dutch. Others of you resonated with the athlete. Don't say amen, Randy. Anybody else? <laughs> but this one I can resonate with. I got any, can I get a witness? Anybody else? All right. Hard-working Farmer. That brings back some memories. Notice what it says. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get the share of his crop. So he tells us, a strong disciple is a hard worker. Hard worker. Now, should we work smart? Yes. I've heard, you know, oftentimes, and I've said it myself, we say, well, listen, we don't need to work harder. We just need to work smarter. I say, no, we need to do both. We need to work harder and smarter. Evan, he said that, Evan there said that very thing this week in our staff meeting. Yes, we need to work harder and smarter. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. Is it easy for a pastor to get discouraged? Yeah. God blessed me this week, not only with the salvation that occurred and the three that I hear about in our, in our youth, but, I, you know, pastors get discouraged. But here's how God blessed me. God, God reminded me this week of the law of the harvest. You got to toil the field. You don't just get the harvest unless you put in what? Unless you put in the, the work. You got to toil the field. You got to plant the seed. Before you can reap a harvest. And one of our blessed remembers reminded me this morning... I was talking of this with her, and she said, now, now, Pastor, sometimes before you toil the field, you've got to remove the rocks. <laughs> and I said, you're right. <laughs> That's where we're at, folks. 
we got to remove the rocks, toil the land, plant the seed, and expect a great harvest. But what's it going to take? Hard work. Hard work. All of us working together, rolling up our sleeves. What does the Bible tell us? In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, pray to the Lord of the harvest to do what? To send out pew setters. Huh? Is that what it says? Now, when I used to preach in the prisons and I would say something like that, you know what they'd say? No, preacher, that's not it. No, that's not what it says. I used to love it. I'd just throw something out there every now and then to, to, to tease them. They'd say, oh, no, preacher, that's not what it says. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out pew setters. It says pray to the Lord of the harvest to do what? To send out laborers, to send out workers into his harvest. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. A strong disciple, hear me now, a strong disciple is a hard worker. It is, Paul compares it to a hard working farmer. A strong disciple is one who labors in the harvest in order to see people saved. God blesses this church with many soul winners. But I want to highlight one just for a, mention, a minute. Alan Pyatt. I get embarrassed sometimes by how much he shares the gospel. I'm like, man, Alan's going to call me today and tell me somebody he shared the gospel with. I better hurry up and do it too so I can have a testimony to share back, right? I got one up him, you know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. But man, that guy's always sharing the gospel. He's a laborer, hardworking farmer. Man, God gives a church full of people like that. You imagine what would happen? Give us a church full of strong disciples who are hard workers and who are willing to go out into the harvest and roll up their sleeves and do what it takes to toil the field and plant the seed so that we'll see lost people saved. And by the way, your, the place where you're to toil, yeah, we have outreach up here at the church, and we want everybody to come to outreach, but listen, the place where you're to toil is where you serve. Your school, your job, you're to be a hardworking farmer at school, you're to be a hardworking farmer at your job, at your, wherever you are, you're to be, that's where God has planted you. Don't just wait for Sunday or Sunday afternoon outreach. No, it's to be a way of life. If you're in the military, that's where you are to toil. That's where you are to plant seed. If you're an attorney, that's where you're to toil. That's where you're to plant seed. If you're in the school, that's where you are to toil. That's where you are to plant seed. So, strong disciples, focused soldiers, disciplined athletes, hardworking farmers. What does God want from you? Stay focused, be disciplined, work hard. There's an illustration that I like to use. And I'm going to use it now. Some of you have already heard it. We've had a couple of dinners this past week, and I used this illustration. So forgive me if you've already heard it, but it fits real good right here, and I want to use it, okay? There are four different people who play the game. Let's talk about a football game. Are you all with me? There are those who only get sweat stains on their uniform. You know who those who are? Those are, those are the guys who stand on the sideline. They don't ever get in to play. They got the uniform on, but all they get on their uniform is sweat stains because they never get in the game. And then you have those who get grass stains on their uniform. They get in the game, but they don't stay very long. Just long enough to get grass stains. Then you have those who get, get dirt stains. They get in the game and they do well, they play, but they just don't give it their all. And they've got mud stains, they've got dirt stains. Then there's the fourth. And those, who, those are the ones who walk off the field with the blood stains on their uniform because they've left everything on the field. Folks, when the Lord Jesus Christ calls me home, 
I want to walk off the field with blood stains on my uniform because I've given the Lord my best as a strong disciple. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then, ye people, join the happy throng. Blend our or blend your voices in triumph song. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle. See his banner go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the cross of Jesus, constant, will remain. Marching as to war. Oh, we are marching as to war. Onward then, ye people. Join our happy throng. Blend your voices in triumph song. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. How will you walk off the field when it's all said and done? As a soldier? Or as a bystander. Would you bow in prayer with me this morning? The invitation is pretty clear. I'm speaking to the disciples right now. Disciple, would you consider would you consider yourself a strong disciple? Are you staying focused? Are you disciplined? Are you working hard in the harvest? Perhaps you would say, Pastor, somewhere along the way I laid down my cross. I picked it up and I came out of the gate strong. But I grew weary because I relied on my own strength instead of his. And I've been standing by and I've been watching. And I'm convicted this morning. Can the Lord forgive me? Will he forgive me? Absolutely. He loves you. But you've got to be willing to come and Humble yourself before him. Here in a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. If, and dear disciple, if, that, if that's you, and you just want to come and rededicate your life this morning, would you please come and do that? We're going to make those, public, those three dedications public this morning. So you come. Say, Pastor, I'm just coming to rededicate my life. I laid down my cross, but now I'm picking it back up. By his grace and through his strength, I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to be disciplined, and I'm going to work hard. Would you come this morning when I ask you to stand? Just make that commitment. Let us pray with you. Others of you this morning, you're not saved. There's never been a time in your life where you've truly trusted in Jesus. You've gone through the motions, and you've done a lot of good things, but you've been trying to overcompensate. You've been trying to earn God's love instead of just receiving His love by faith. And you want to come this morning and say, Lord, I, I just need you in my life. I love you. I want to abandon my old way of life and I, want to, and I want to adhere to you. I want to be saved. I need your forgiveness. You are my Lord and you are my master. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Would you come this morning and let me pray with you? Perhaps let one of the other pastors pray with you. You come. Heavenly Father, we pray for a movement now of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand right now and begin to come as the Lord leads? You come.